right, welcome to this edition of the Wally Bressler Show. You know, it's interesting. They say people who can do and people who can't teach. Well, my guest today actually can do and he can teach like a madman. Super successful real estate agent, uh, educator, great podcast, Know Your Shit, which I was on and I loved, and also the author of The Roadmap, Roadmap of the American Dream. If you're looking to learn from a true professional what it takes to be successful in this real estate market, you've come to the right place. Welcome, Josh Cadillac. How are you, buddy? Wally, I'm hanging out with you, buddy. It's going to be a good day. That, that, that is the litmus test right there. That's right. Well, I appreciate that. Not everybody feels the way you do, but you're a kind man. So <laughs> let's get right into it. You and I are from the same part of the world. We're in the real estate industry. What was it? Because I know you do crypto trading too, right? And Or investing in stuff like that. What is it that got you into real estate to begin with? I'm always intrigued by people's stories. So why don't we, why don't we start there? Um, well, my dad was a real estate investor for most of his life. He had a, a large industrial operation in New York that um, required him to take and accumulate a lot of industrial real estate. And so as I was coming up, a lot of that was, he was selling his positions there and he was leasing a lot of those spaces out. So I was involved with it from that standpoint. And after my father passed, the last couple of pieces in New York, we were able to take and get rid of and acquire some commercial assets down in Southeast Florida, which is where we've been living for quite a long time. Nice. And so from there, when 2008 sort of happened, I had just gotten long in I was I was still long in real estate. And I got long in res restaurants. Wow! And so uh, yeah, no. If you want to talk about the, the place not to be, did someplace sort of did you get long and dead too? Did you get long and dead at the same time? I got <laughs> I I got out and I lost just about everything, Wally. I oh, had to start from absolute part of that club too. Yep. scratch. Part of that club and too. so um, I was like, well, what what is it that I know how to do? Uh, because, you know, I wasn't the go to college guy. That was not my, my shtick. Mm -hmm. Um, I was done with writing papers. I was done with all that stuff. I mean, I'd always had businesses. I'd always been working and right. now I, I found myself short. And so, um, real estate seemed to be the obvious thing. And so that's what I did. I, I got my license. I actually got my general contractor's license at the same time and, uh, you know, wanted to take and figure out what the best place was. And so real estate really was uh, out of necessity, if you will. A uh, lack of options, perhaps. That's what uh, where I was, and I didn't have give myself the option to fail. I know, and and everybody give themselves, you know, failure is not an option. The real estate industry would be entirely different today than it is. So I uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, when when we talk we talked last week, you had mentioned that once you once you were done, you're like I'm not writing another paper, I'm not I'm not speaking to anybody, and now and now you you said you were like 35 different courses, you've written a book. And you speak all day long. So how did you make that transition to doing all that when you were pretty much adamantly opposed to it at the beginning? Well, Wally, I'm, I'm a big believer in the, uh, the idea of vocation, the idea that we are kind of all made differently yeah. and we're made for something. And we kind of are spending most of our life trying to figure out what God already knew about us when he made us, mm -hmm. if you will, which is he knew what he made and we're trying to figure out what the hell he made. And so for me, I had this very strong opinion as to what I was and who I was and how I was. And as it turned out, that's not exactly who I was or how I was. So it took a lot of uh, beating my head against the wall and, you know, pushing very hard to make the square peg fit in the round hole. And, you know, successfully, I got a lot of square pegs into some round freaking holes, dude. Um, we made a lot of money and did well, but... This thing that I do now is is pretty much pure joy. Nice. Um, I enjoy it. I enjoy every day. I, I enjoy the, uh, you know, going out there and and you know writing new stuff and doing new stuff mm -hmm. and uh, and helping agents, man. I mean, I I know what they didn't tell me, Wally. I know how poorly prepared I was to be the entrepreneur that you have to be in the real estate business. Nobody ever even told me I was running my own business. I had to figure that out on my own as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And so if I could take and help agents avoid the pain. And the mistakes, I consider that to be a worthwhile use of my time. Sure, sure. And obviously, it, it, you know, just giving somebody the the ammunition they need to continue to move forward is, is sometimes it will change their life forever. I mean, you know, 80 plus percent of real estate agents don't even make it to the first renewal of their real estate license. And most of them do so because they run out of money before they start making any money, you know. And the other thing is, is I don't think people are prepared for the amount of work you have to do, the number of phone calls you have to make and the amount of resilience it requires. You know, and, and it's hard to compete when you're new. You really have to scrap and fight. You know, one of your tenets is, is helping. I think what you said was, is that, you know, it's important that real estate agents to be successful, know their product. Yep. And then also you're like, hey, we all need to be 
true advocates, and I think you said trusted resources, I think were the word you used. So number one, in, in, in your definition, what is a real estate agent's product? And then number two, how do they position themselves as advocates and resources for people? So let's go two parts on that. Sure. I, I think that understanding the product is is actually one of the great mysteries in real estate in the sense that I, I, I don't ever remember seeing an advertisement ever that talked about what's good about real estate. I mean, what a real estate advertisement looks like is an agent's face and maybe there's a little itty bitty, uh, like a, a diagram of a house in the back corner, but that's, that's what a real estate advertisement is. There is nothing we do in real estate to try to motivate the customer to want our product more. There is never us exposing them to things about our product that they didn't know. And so an example. the fact that an example would be like, there's a reasonable expectation of making a profit in real estate when you buy a home to live in. Right. Sure. And so I did a side by side comparison of a three hundred twenty five thousand dollar purchase versus a twenty five hundred and fifty dollar a month rental. I did this in one of my classes just as an interesting thing to see what the difference cash flow wise, what well, not cash flow, what cash on pocket was. And the differential between the two on a five year hold, sixty three thousand dollars. My purchaser has $63,000 more dollars in wealth they built, $1,000 more a month in wealth for owning versus renting. That's with me doing the analysis the way that a, as a commercial agent, as I was taught on the commercial side, yeah. you got to take and make two unlike things alike. So I added in an extra $200 a month on the purchase to account for repairs and maintenance, to account for capital improvement, everything. I made it as fair as I possibly could, mm -hmm. 63000 bucks. Uh, another example would be nearly 90% of all businesses that exist in the United States of America today were started by somebody taking out equity against the primary residence that they live in. That makes the product we sell as a residential agent, the single greatest wealth building tool that's ever existed for the common man in the history of recorded human history. That's what we sell every day. And the thing that kills me, Wally, is none of the folks out there trying to sell it know it. Right. And you know, a lot of those businesses fail because they don't understand. Of and course. They, and they don't understand what the upside is and they don't know how to get there. That's why I did the thumb downs, not because you're a bad what you said, but I really wish you were more passionate about this though. You really, you know, you shouldn't hold yeah, no, it's... You shouldn't hold back. It's terrible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, so that, that that's the understanding of the product. Let's talk about trusted resource and, and, and being a an, trusted advocate and being a resource. Let's talk about what your definitions of those are and, and how people portray that as real estate agents. I'm, I'm intrigued. Well, I think that the starting point for that really is to understand why that's important is that we in general need to understand our customer and what our customer wants from us, right? And it's not another buddy. It's not another friend. What they want is someone that knows their stuff. Hence the reason why the product knowledge is so important. And then it, it it's kind of a double-edged sword a little bit, Wally. If you run into somebody that's really sharp at what they do, you almost are a little nervous working with that person because if they're this much smarter than me, they could easily take advantage of me, right? And so it's it's not just leaving the customer with a sense that you know your product well. It's that you know it well and that you will look out for them like their family. Like nobody, your primary job is to make sure that nobody pulls the wool over their eyes on your watch. Right on. Nobody gets the fastball by you. And as long as they got you, they're going to be okay because you're not going to let anybody get to them. And that's a matter of defining to the customer what your business is about. My business is not about earning paychecks. My business is closing customers for life. My business is that when they're done working with me, they never look for another agent again. They're done, finished. They got one on their guy. That's it. So wait a second, you being in a bikini on, on Instagram or you sharing what you eat or you putting something funny about how other agents suck, you're saying that's not the thing to do on social media? Well, as many hits as I did get on that one episode where I did have the fishnets on, Wally, it was that, not yeah. really, no, it's not what this business yeah. is about. Yeah, you know, it's interesting too. And I think people, and listen, I'm, you know, we've been in the business a long time, both of us, you know what I'm saying? And so I, I, I just have, because I can do coaching as well, I have access to grind with all these people and I... Everyone, I try not to call people out. Sometimes I have trouble. Like sometimes I go to their page. I'm like, you know, thanks for going and talking about another agent and speaking poorly of them because that helps all of us look so much better in the public of the eyes of the public. Oh I hate that, but you know, so many agents these days really they're taking the whole social media of like, hey, you got to get to know me. They're taking that as let me invite you into my life, and they're not adding any value, right? Like you're you're a freaking expert. You know what I'm saying? Not only you're, you're an expert, not just 
from the standpoint you can have your clients, but you can teach other agents the stuff that they need to know. And I think, can you talk more about that? Because I don't think people realize how important being an expert is, especially in this environment where things are, they ha it's not like oh, we're not riding the wave, like we're not hockey stick growth here. This is where being an expert matters. What's your definition of being an expert? What are you teaching your folks right now? I, the, the the necessity of being the expert is the only way to to win the most critical negotiation that determines whether or not you're going to have this customer come forward, continue with you going mm -hmm. forward. Which is that 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 negotiation for credibility. That's establishing that I am the expert you need because they're coming to me with a problem, right? And so my job is to establish on the way in as quickly as I can. I'm so glad you have a problem because what I eat, live, breathe, and sleep is solving problems. Yep. So that, that that necessity is integral to building a real estate business and not just being transactionally trying to survive. Right on. So to me, if I'm going to break it down as simply as I can, there's really three markets that the agent needs to be aware of in order to be seen as the expert. Mm -hmm. One is the macro market. I want to know the national market, what's going on in, in real estate nationwide. Mm -hmm. Because if I have that component, it allows me to take the next component, which is my local market, and juxtapose the two in conversation with the customer okay. saying, hey, look, the national market is doing this. Our market is doing this. And here's why it's doing that. Agents are really good at telling people what's happening. They're really bad at telling them why. And so like I, my cab driver could tell me what's happening in the real estate market. Mm -hmm. I don't need that. I need somebody to tell me why it's happening and what I need to do to be on the right side of what's going on. That's what an expert is for. And so that's the piece that's missing, I think, Wally. Right. And you said you had two more, but real quickly, you know, it's interesting because I, I don't think people realize how important it is for you to say to somebody, hey, listen, you know what? Interest rates have come down. They're still high because inflation is still high. And home prices are still fairly buoyant, but it's not so much because the market's great. It's because there's limited inventory, right? Mm -hmm. But as long as you're going to live in this house for the next five years or more, it's probably, it's still a good idea to buy a home because basically over just about any five-year period in the market, with exception to the Great Recession, your home was worth more than it was when you bought it, right? And But most agents can't articulate that. They can't, they can't say that, you know what I mean? So- well, most agents aren't looking at the history of real estate. One of the cool things that I love about that real estate is that we have this beautiful, long history of real estate that we can look at, and we can see when certain economic pressures are applied to real estate, how it behaves. Mm -hmm. And as much as everybody is waiting for this market to tank, real estate tends to disproportionately do well right. when there is inflation. A normal real estate appreciation for a decade is around 50 to 60% from from in that 10 year span. The last inflationary market we had, real estate appreciated 177.6%. So why would I not be getting long in the one product? Cause I mean, the stock market, how's that holding up for you, right? Why would I not be getting long in the one product that has a reputation of doing great as the value of money goes down? It's a tangible asset. Right on. Nothing that is tangible has gotten cheaper. It's all got more expensive. Only one recession in the entire history of mankind has the real estate market done well. And that was the one that was created by the real estate market itself. And that's the great recession. That's right. And that was predicated on a, a right angle turn. There's never been a right angle turn in real estate, except for the one time that lenders had to take an overnight, drastically change the rules by mm -hmm. which the market played by overnight. They had gone from expanding the demand for real estate excessively to overnight recognizing that lenders faced an existential crisis and didn't go back to the original earlier lending criteria. Oh. They went to a draconian lending criteria that had about this many people mm -hmm. that could now afford real estate and left us from a uh, massive undersupply or uh, at least a quasi undersupply to a massive oversupply yeah. so, overnight because nobody could anymore qualify for a property. Real estate doesn't move like that, folks. Real estate's a cruise ship. You ever ride a cruise ship, guys, you can't even tell when it's pulling away from the port because it moves so slowly. It builds momentum and it goes. It doesn't do right angle turns. The only one that ever happened is when the liquidity was pulled out of the market overnight because of all the bad loans that were made. And if you compare the first time mortgage applicant can approval rate back in 2006 and early 2007 with the numbers today, you will see that the bank is underwriting at a very strict, under a very strict criteria, the odds of them stopping Stopping doing the very thing that funds their business, the lending of money, is non-existent in yeah. today's market. We can thank our good friends Dodd Frank and the D, D, D CFPB for putting our, their foot on the throat of the real estate market at that point. So you know, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. that didn't help. Yeah, yeah right. it's true.
So number one market is the national market. What are the other two markets we need to be paying attention to? I, I kind of referenced the second one. The second one is your your market, which I'll call your market is going to be any place you take a listing. Right. All right. So there's a difference between where I, the third market, which is where I'd farm, and where I take a listing. Would you take a listing, you know, 10, 15, 20 miles? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I'd take a listing there. So I have to be able to go and intelligently speak in that market to that seller about what's going on in that market to win their business. And the way that I'm going to do that is by juxtaposing the national market with the, with the, with their market and what's going on in their market and how those two things are different. The third market is obviously the farm market that I work. If I'm an agent that has a farm, many agents do, I need to know that farm market like it's one of my kids. You just adopted a brand new kid. If they got a new principal at the high school, you, need to you know. should know. Right. This is the level of knowledge. You can't have that not level of knowledge about your broader market that's too in-depth. But that area where you're trying to take and, and create dominance, you need to have that dominance level of knowledge of what's going on to sit here and say, once again, folks, it's all about the fastball. Nobody gets the fastball by you on your watch. The things that you need to know about, you need to be ready. You need to be up there at the plate, ready to hit every time you go up. And it's not that hard. We have the greatest tool in the universe available to us, where as far as data goes, which is just for the, at least the last two, your, your market and your farm, the MLS, guys. The MLS will tell you almost everything that you need to know if you just take and save some searches and look at them once a, once a week. And most of all, most MLS is actually crunch numbers for you too. They'll give you some highs and lows and medians and averages, so you don't have to figure it out yourself. You know, absolutely. And I mean, just just opening a search up and right. looking at the same search every week to see what's different. Take and spend five minutes with the numbers. Yep. You've turned yourself into a person that is now monitoring trend. When you can go into a meeting with customers and talk about trend, hey, look, the last six months is what we've seen, but in the last two months we've noticed this. You've just distanced yourself from all your competitors because you know what they're talking about? Gee, uh, I love the millions on those windows. Yeah, but here's – and that's the thing. And I, as, I'm, as you're saying this, I'm thinking to myself, if you cannot articulate what's going on right now in the market and how it's going to impact your, your, your seller prospects and buyer prospects and their selling and buying decisions – you will not earn their business because you cannot give them the information they need, number one, to make a decision, and number two, to make the decisions that's best for them. Because you're not, if you're not educated, you can't educate them, period, end of discussion. And, and it's really two parts, Wally, because there's a lot of agents that I know. This is the other piece that I've really picked up on. There's a lot of agents that take a ton of classes. And as soon as they walk out, you know, they, they've learned a bunch, but that's it. The reality is I have to take, and you, you keep hitting on it, that idea of articulating it. I need to spend as much time thinking about how I'm going to turn what I just learned around and give it to a customer in a way that sounds organic for me as I do learning it. I need to package it up and give it to the person in a way that's most helpful for them. If I'm not doing that, I'm not actually meeting the customer's need of providing them with someone they perceive as a true market expert. Right. And that's what it breaks down to. So expertise notwithstanding, let's let's just say that expertise is, you know, we call it table stake. It's it's one oh one. Like you have to be an expert to be a successful real estate agent, doesn't matter what the market is. Where other than not being an expert, which a lot of agents unfortunately aren't right now because they're almost they're so panicked that they can't even move, where are real estate agents missing the boat right now too? Because you how long have you been in the business now? You said what, oh eight, no nine? You, like I got in an oh eight. Oh yep. So now we're looking at fifteen years. So oh wait, you saw the Great Recession, you also saw um, let me think here. You saw COVID, right? So you've seen a couple of crazy things since, you know, saw the, saw the non-performing mortgage market that I was a big player in. Absolutely. I, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, what are, what, what, where are real estate is, cause you talk to thousands of agents every year. I do too. Where are agents missing the boat right now? Okay. So there's, there's three things. And this is what the book that I just wrote is, is really sort of about. Give us the name again, please. Uh, the book is called close for life. And that's available. And it's, on on Amazon? Amazon. it's on Amazon and it's from McGraw Hill. It'll be, It'll wow. be out, I think, in July. Yeah, in McGraw Hill. Yeah, no, that's the thing. Good for you, brother. And so um, there's there's really kind of, th I'm going to say three three point five, three three and a half things. Okay. There's three big things and and one one little thing that's really quite huge in its own right. Okay. Um, the first thing that the agents get wrong is they forget to be the CEO of their business. They forget oh. to be a good CEO for themselves. Amen, amen. amen. And so we are really, really bad bosses to ourselves. We, 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 we give ourselves passes when we should. We hold ourselves 
too accountable for things that are outside of our control. And, and we don't sit here and ask ourselves, what would a good boss be like to work with? What, what would they care about? What would be a good boss? And how can I be that to myself, mm-hmm. right? How would I hold myself accountable? Because a good boss is going to want to get the best out of you, right? A good boss is going to care about you more than just what you can produce as work. Right. They're going to care about you and having a good life and having that life be reflective of standards that you have. And so to me, it kind of tracks back to the idea of, of standards, Wally, um, because in order for my CEO to know what they need to get my staff to do, the CEO needs to figure out what this business is all about. And when I say about this business, I mean my life. Mm-hmm. What's it going to be about? What are the hills that I want to die on that I think matter and are part of a good life? Sure. And, and to your point, one of the best questions, I'm not sure I, I know who I learned this from, but they said, hey, listen, you're, if you were the CEO of your business, which you are, could you afford to keep yourself on as an employee based on your production, based on the mm-hmm. things you're doing? Could I afford to keep you and pay you what I'm going to pay you for what you're doing? You know what I'm saying? So you got to kind of look at it both ways as a CEO and as, hey, listen, as a CEO, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And, and, and I, the reason I say this is, you're going to golf. You got to drive balls. You got to hit 500 drive balls. You got to drive 500 balls. You got to chip 500 balls. You got to putt 500 balls. If you're going to cook, you got to learn how to saute and bake and and do all that other stuff. And if you're going to sell houses, you got to do the things that real estate agents do. You got to prospect. You got to follow up. You got to train yourself. You know what I'm saying? And if you're not willing to do those things, then you really don't deserve to have the business. Absolutely. So the question is whether or not that's within the vocation that you have, whether or not you're made, you're wired to be able to do that, whether you're that kind of person. And two, whether you possess the administrative ability to hold yourself accountable for these tasks. Because I got news for you, folks. I don't know anybody that likes everything that you have to do in real estate in order to do real estate as a business. Right. There's some people that love pro. They love meeting people and talking to people. They love networking events and all that kind of stuff. Wally, I am I am such a fish out of water at a networking event. I got no business being there. But you know what? If you want to know where a contract from 2012 is, I will pull it up for you in two seconds. You give me the name because my systems are tight and I, I'm, my deals close. My deals close because I, I know where everything is, right? So I play to my strengths and my CEO knows the strengths of my staff. And when it when my CEO needs the company to do something that's not within the strengths of my staff, right? I outsource it rather than feel guilty about it. Right. I'm going to go hire to make it happen. Or I figure out if there's a way that I can take and motivate, manipulate, do whatever I got to do to get my staff to get it done. If I can't do that, my job as the CEO is to make sure that everything that needs to get done in the business gets done. Right now, this is the business I run. So, standard number one: be the true CEO of your business. So we got two and a half more. So, what's number two? Number two is is understanding the product. We talked about that a little bit already. So that would be the other one we've already kind of covered. Number and the other one is is understanding the customer. Okay, we got to know who the customer is. Oh my god! And so, w- where that matters is. In real estate, it kind of seems like they think from the training that the customer needs a new friend. Like the customer, I like to say it all the time, like the they, the way they train us is like the customer's sitting there with a big bowl of popcorn in their lap, watching TV on a Friday evening thinking, waiting for our call. I, I'm lonely. You know what I need? I need a real estate agent. That would fix it. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way that's the logical progression that the customer has. Have you ever prospected before and had the, and the, and the client say, I'm so glad you called i've been waiting yeah like it doesn't happen Never. it doesn't happen <laughs> and so who is the customer what do they need from us i gotta figure that out because that is my that is going to determine my ability to meet them where they're at if i'm better at meeting a need that they have whether spoken or unspoken than the next person i have a better shot at the business than they do right on. if i sound like everyone else if it's like uh, one of the analogies I like to use is is a woman at the bar. A what? I, 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 a, a woman at the bar. Okay. So a woman goes to the bar. She's sitting there. She's having a drink. Right. Had a long day, not a hard day. She's just sitting there enjoying a cocktail, a little little adult beverage, and somebody walks up to her, and proceeds to drop on her the most worn out, used up pickup line, ever uttered. Something along the lines of, "Hey, baby, what's your sign?" Right. <laughs> Make sure you're showing your chain in your chest there while you got it. Absolutely. You got to have like only button to your navel, right? And <laughs> and so she's going to she's gonna cringe, right? A little piece of her soul just died. She's never getting back. Right. Her outlook for the continued existence of our species has just fallen. Option two, somebody goes up and says something to her over their shoulder. She doesn't quite get it right away. And then when she does, 
She almost falls off her bar stool laughing, even though she's only halfway through her first drink. She's got tears coming down. Her cheeks hurt. Her stomach hurts. She may have peed herself just a little bit. Who do you think gets her phone number? I got a second guy. All day, every day. In our business, we're the person approaching the woman at the bar. If we say the same crap that everybody else does, why the hell should she talk to us? And so if I'm going to sound like anyone else, I should not be surprised when I get treated like that other person. How do people treat salespeople? Click. So I need to go in there sounding like something different because I understand my customer is oversold to every single day. Differences sell, right? That's it. What's the That's hat? What's the, and by the way, if you're calling expires and you're just, hey, listen, I noticed your home's not in the market anymore. You still want to get that home sold? That's like the 40th time they've heard that. Like, you've got to be creative, you know? What's the half? What's the half? You see they're three and a half. What's the half? The other half is, is and I say it's half only because I, I really didn't spend a ton of time on it in, in the book because it's, it's so obvious. It's just the follow-up with your customers after the fact. Oh, my God, guys. I mean, we have a 12% customer retention rate in this industry. Terrible. And 88% of clients said they would give a referral if they asked for it, but most agents don't. Think about that. 88% said, hey, I'd refer somebody if you asked me. I knew it was 11, 12. Amazing. Like, that, that's right on. I mean, that's stupid. That's one out of six. I mean, probably one out of eight, right? It, it, it's nearly nine out of 10 times, almost nine out of 10 times. Rather than use you again, they go out and interview somebody else. Right. Because they can't be bothered to look up your information because they forgot who the hell you are. Right. But I'm saying because one, you, one out of eight is that we ask. Nine out of 10 is when they do it, roughly. I got it. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, no. Exactly. It, it, and so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I, one. I, I think about this and I say to myself, in what business could you function in this way and be successful? I mean, the, I, I kid around. I say the only business where you could have a worse customer retention rate than us is Mortician. I was but just other than that, home. <laughs> yeah, you know, like other than that, yeah. where else could you get away with this? Yes. And so we, we've got to take and recognize that the reason why this is occurring is we're not taking the customer fully into account. Right on. We're not figure out who they are and what they want from us and how I can give it to them better than they can get it someplace else. And so if the, if we're going to take an, and the customer is going to have an experience of, with us, of us, for 30, 60, 90, 120 days, if you can't close them that time, folks, I got to tell you what, the way most agents do business is like, like love life at the club, man. They go there, tap that, and on to the next one, boy. I do not believe in one night stand real estate. That's no good. No bueno. If you're not closing customers for life, you're not building a business. You're not doing the real estate business. You're out there working a real estate job, being an employee, just trying to get paid to keep the lights on. Nice. I love it. You're, I love it. you're not investing in your future. I love it. And that's why it's only a one, one trick pony for people, you know? So yeah. you're, you're an educator by heart. You bring a lot of value to the table. My understanding is you have the, the most approved CE courses in Florida. I believe so. Yeah. I'm at 35, maybe 36 soon. Right. People need CE classes. How do they find you? There's a few ways. Closeforlife.com mm -hmm. is, is one way you can see the classes that I have. If uh, folks ta te uh, text my last name, Cadillac, uh, to the number 66866, they'll actually get an email twice a month that lets them know where I'm teaching, what I'm teaching. A lot of stuff is via Zoom, although mm -hmm. there's a lot more in-person stuff now. Cadillac. And Instagram, Josh D. Cadillac. Sorry, I didn't mean So Instagram, Josh D. Cadillac. Text 66866. And then to that number, text Cadillac to that number. That's correct. Okay, good. And, uh, um, and you have, my understanding, the only crypto approved real estate CE class too? I have three actually, uh, two, yeah, two okay. crypto classes and one, and one on blockchain, one on um, tokenization um, in, Flo in Florida. I don't believe anybody else has anything still yet approved Can, on for, crypto. For knuckleheads like me, when you say, is that buying property using crypto? It is. Well, f the first class is really for, to help agents go through the, the uncomfortable process I went through of not being a crypto guy mm -hmm. and now having to become the guy that's going to take can teach crypto. Somebody wrote me into like, hey, you should write a course on crypto. I'm like, well, great, but I don't know anything about crypto. So I'm not not even owning a hoodie, Wally. I, di I didn't have a hoodie. I, I didn't live in my mom's basement. So I was ill prepared to be a crypto guy. And um, well, anyway, 
we're old. So there's a, there's a there's a little bit of a of a of a stereotype going. Although when you go to a crypto event, you do see a, a disproportionate number of hoodies there. I'm I'm just going to say it's a thing. But um, I wasn't. I, I had to take and go through the process of getting my head wrapped around why this thing matters. And as an investor, I, I typically look at investments from the standpoint of is there anything here that's got legs? Like, is this something really solving a real problem or is this just a fad? And crypto seems to solve some real problems that exist with money as we have it today, especially when you look at Bitcoin and what Bitcoin has overcome. Uh, because we wouldn't be talking about blockchain and we wouldn't be talking about crypto if it was not for Bitcoin. That Bitcoin alone. has been the proof case that this stuff works. Yeah, that alone is the reason, the, one of the reasons to give you a call. So, um, and I love that. Thanks. And again, difference in sell. You know what I'm saying? If I'm going to go get my CEs, why not learn from a guy who can teach me how to do something that other people aren't doing? What a great, imagine you're, you're like, you're telling your clients, you're dealing with millennials, especially like, hey, I've got a great crypto solution for you with respect to your property needs. That alone is going to differentiate you significantly. That's like blowing a dog whistle and letting the right people, the right here, dogs here, so to speak. So that's awesome. All right. Your book is coming out or it's out now? It's coming out. It's available for pre-order on Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's called again. Close to Life. Okay. And then uh, they can do 66866. They can text uh, Cadillac to that or just check out Josh D. Cadillac on Instagram. And yeah. um, awesome. Thank you so much. You were amazing. I'm, I'm sure we could talk about this for a freaking a year and a row, two years with all the stuff you have in your head. <laughs> um, you know, my, my, my goal, my goal is, as part of these podcasts is to inspire and, uh, and educate people. And so what I'd like you to do is tell me like one of the biggest challenges you overcame in your life and how it shaped your business and your life. Um, man, there's, there's been, been quite a few. I mean, starting from scratch again was, was terrifying. And, um, uh, the, the amount of shame associated with, you know, losing the things that your father had left you, um, after he had cautioned you time and time again, you know, from the people to the people in three generations and all. But the idea that I've really been kind of hanging on to while he recently is, is this idea of uh, representational legacy, this idea that my choices represent the legacy of all those people who are kind enough and generous enough to give me any of their time to invest in me. And so I think that, you know, like when you watch a movie and you see the hero get beaten down. And everybody loves that moment where they find that last little bit of reserve to take and stand back up again and give it everything they've got. And, and, and oftentimes in a movie, that's enough to get you over the edge. Not in life, it doesn't necessarily not always. work out. Mm -hmm. But ha having that rally point, having so that, that rally, I guess that's starting to interrupt, but what is, that's what I'm looking for right there is obviously you did it because you got a great business. You're helping real estate agents all across the country. And again, sorry to interrupt you, but I, you know, what was it like shame is horrible. I lived in shame for 45 plus years. I get it. It's, you know, it's a, it's the Sucks. weighted, it's the weighted blanket of all weighted blankets. How did you get yeah. through that? You know, cause you could have easily just said, you know, screw it. I'm just going to go get a job. It was, it was a matter of, of what I chose to focus on. And so I have contr having control of what you think about is a learned skill, right? Self, self discipline and, all this stuff is, is a practiced and learned thing. And, and you, you, you practice and learn it every single day right with the choices that you make. And so I, I chose to set up choices and opportunities for me to take and set a precedent of being a winner to myself in the sense that I started winning those. You have the choice to go left or right. Well, I committed to going right all day today, so I'm going right. Um, you know, going to the gym, eating better, all these things. I set it up in such a way that it was, I didn't set super high goals that was setting myself up to fail. I set really right. low ones that gave me a chance to start to w get to this precedent of winning. And I remembered the fact that I, you know, I, I, I am the legacy of a lot of people that went on before me that aren't here anymore. And so what I live and how I live it is largely, um, their return on investment for their time on me. And one of my standards for myself is my investors always make money. I love that. That's so awesome. I, I, gotta, I gotta give them a return. And so that to me was just something to hang on to because of how my crazy is wired. Wally, that when I got when I got down, it helped me find that rally point, put my gloves back on the mat, lift myself back up again and, and go in there and try to trade a few more blows. Love it. You shared so much amazing information with us today, folks. If you're looking to up your expertise game. If you really want to learn how to be the absolute best you can in what you do, Josh Cadillac is your man. He's got tons of courses. He's got stuff online. He's got books. 
He can teach you more than you can shake a stick at. So please take the time to reach out to him. Let him fill your brain with some great stuff. And clearly he's going to fill your heart with some good stuff too. Any final words before we let you go? You know what, folks? Look down at your hands. Look at them. And you know what that is? That is visual representation that you have survived 100% of everything life has thrown at you so far. Love that. So guess what? You might be a little tougher than you give yourself credit for. I love that. I think we're all tougher than we realize. That right there is my man, Josh Cadillac. I'm Wally Bressler. This has been the Wally Bressler Show. Be kind to yourself.